Sunday. We remember on Friday, Jesus was hung with two thieves, one on each side, crown of thorns on his head. But Jesus has overcome sin, death, and the devil for us. So we make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Three. <laughs> Thank you. 
Easter. Our first reading comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow, swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. 
whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. Hello, please stand for the reading of the gospel, the holy gospel according to St. Mark, the 16th chapter speaks of the resurrection of Jesus. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome brought, brought, bought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early in the, on the first day of the week, when the sun had arisen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for, from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they, uh, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the gospel of our Lord, and praise to you, O Christ. On his Resurrection Sunday, we're going to just pray that the power of the resurrected Jesus would, would just blow you away wherever you're at in, in, your, in your life. May the indwelling power of the, of the Holy Spirit it, living in you would just transform your life completely. That this is the day that the Lord has made. That because Jesus has risen, that changes everything. Let's, let's pray. Father, we come into your presence praising you and thank you that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. We thank you, Lord God, that he is risen and that changes everything. Lord God, by the power of your spirit, transform us. Make us more into the image of Jesus. Help us to walk with you, Lord God, that in the, in the troubles and trials and tribulations of this world, Lord God, that we would know that we're held in the resurrected arms of Jesus, that he is the life, he is our salvation in him, we cannot be put to shame. In him, we have hope. In him, we have a future. In him, we have eternal life. So Lord God, we praise you and thank you for all that you have done for us in and through Jesus. Send us, Lord God, as your ambassadors in this community in which you live. You desire that all would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. You desire that every single person on the Penn State campus would turn to you, the true and the living God. You desire that every single person in Happy Valley would turn to you and receive the joy of salvation that comes in, in, to, in and through Jesus Christ in a relationship with him by what he has done for him. By his wounds, we have been healed. By his blood, we have been purified and, and, and transformed, and we have been given his righteousness. So we praise you and thank you for all that. But Lord God, we know that there is many people that do not believe. There are many people that do not follow you. We ask, Lord God, that you would use us in any way you see fit, that this would be uh, transformational to us, that because he is alive, that changes everything in our life, Lord God. Send us forth from here as your ambassadors to love the people that you have given your life for, to point them to Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, that we would not put our trust in our strength, in human power, in political institutions, in, in, uh, in our own intellect, in our own knowledge, in the good things that you have given to us, but we would put our trust, our faith completely in Jesus, the Lord of our life. Lord God, change us, transform us, draw us to Jesus. May we follow you. May we proclaim the goodness, the greatness, the awesome deeds that you have done for us, that you are the resurrection and life, and that all who put their faith and trust in you will not be put to shame, but will have the gift of eternal life will be held in your everlasting and loving arms. Draw us to yourself and empower us to be your ambassadors. Send us forth, Lord God. This community desperately needs Jesus. Send us forth now in the power of your spirit as ambassadors of Jesus to proclaim that he is risen. He has defeated the tempter. He has defeated the devil. He has defeated sin. He has defeated death, 
And we are his people. We are his children. Send us forth, Lord God, to impact this community. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And so, Lord God, teach us to pray as you have taught us to pray. Draw us to yourself, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Three. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, and a foretaste of glory divine. There is salvation, purchase of God. Born of the Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. to all of you on this Resurrection Sunday. We're going to be reflecting on the resurrection from Mark chapter 16 verses 1 through 8. Let's pray. Father, we come in your presence giving you praise and thanks for this day that you are the resurrection and the life. Fill us now, Lord God. Direct us by your spirit. Fill us with your spirit. Lead us and guide us, Lord, that the resurrection of Jesus would impact our lives in a powerful and mighty way. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So, we come to the most momentous moment in all of human history, the defining moment in human history. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If there is no resurrection, there should be no Christian church. Uh, there would be no hope for us. There'd be no hope of eternal life. There'd be no forgiveness. All of what Jesus has said would be a lie. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ is attested by witnesses, eyewitnesses in Mark's gospel. We have uh, Mary Magdalene, we have Mary, the mother of James, and we also have Salome as bringing spices to the tomb. Now, with each of the Gospels, the thing that is in common is it is women who are the first eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the only one that is mentioned in, in the uh, 
Gospels consistently is Mary Magdalene. Uh, so Luke's Gospel mentions uh, uh, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary and then several other women. Uh, Matthew's Gospel also mentions uh, them coming. Jo the Gospel of John only mentions Mary Magdalene. So it's kind of interesting. But what's the consistent thing is uh, that it is women that are the first eyewitnesses. And so the gospel writers, whether they mention all of the ones, it looks like they don't name all of them in any of the gospels. Uh, it's just they name a few of them. Some of them name only one of the eyewitnesses. It appears that Mary Magdalene was the chief spokesperson. But when they get there, they, they, the other consistent thing is they're bringing spices to anoint the body of Jesus. They expect to, to find a dead person. But there is no dead person there. And now they're terrified. Now they're astonished. There are words like that. They were trembling and fearful. What is going on? Uh, what is happening here? Uh, so these are things that occurred. And so this resurrection is the defining moment in human history and the defining moment in each person's life. Whether you believe the resurrection or deny the resurrection is the divining moment in your life. And so we've been talking during the season of Lent about temptation and dealing with temptation and unpacking that in our own lives. So when many people think of temptation in their life, I think the first thing that people go to when they say, oh, you know, when they're thinking about temptation, they think of like maybe the big things like money, like power, like sex, uh, things along those lines. And they don't think of uh, the everyday uh, aspects of life where we can fall into temptation. So they, they kind of go to those things. And instead of, instead of the more subtle ways in which temptation can, can weasel its way into our lives, whether it be the desire to control other people or trusting in good things, that they become the thing in our life. Uh, from thinking our accumulation of knowledge diminishes our need for, for God, for salvation. We can just figure things out on our own. We have everything under control. To going down a rabbit hole of seeking status and self-promotion. Every day we face temptations that should drive us to the question, will I trust God with this? Am I going to trust God with this? Or am I going to believe the promise associated with that temptation, which turns out to be a false promise? The temptations come at us in the ordinary moments of life. There are many temptations that Jesus faced in the 24 hours leading up to his crucifixion on the cross. In those critical 24 hours, coming up to that time. Less than 24 hours before the death of Jesus on Good Friday, less than 24 hours from that time, he's doing an ordinary thing. He's having a meal with his disciples. An ordinary happening in all of our lives. Yet Jesus knows that someone who, who, who he's sharing that meal with is going to betray him. It's going to turn him in. It's going to turn against him. Now, if you and I were having a meal with friends and we knew that one of our friends was going to betray us, really hurt us, wouldn't we be tempted to call him out in front of all of our other friends so that we had allies there in the midst of all of this that's going on, in the midst of this betrayal that's going to happen? But Jesus doesn't do that. Surely that was a temptation to have allies come to your defense in the midst of this. He chooses not to out Judas to the rest of the disciples. And he allows Judas to leave the meal and start in motion the wheels that would lead to his arrest. Jesus knew when Jesus, Judas was going to the chief priests with information as to his probable whereabouts that evening. And so he was going to inform them of where Jesus would be in the middle of the night. Jesus knew what Judas was up to. And 
Jesus knew that Judas knew that the common place they would go for prayer and where they were going to go for prayer that night was the Mount of Olives. Jesus could have said to the rest of the disciples after Judas left, hey, let's not go to the Mount of Olives for prayer. Let's go someplace else. Let's go to a new place for prayer. What's, what's the difference? God will hear us. Temptation. But he doesn't, he doesn't do that. The temptation to walk away from danger would be very great. When Jesus is praying in the garden for the cup, that he was about to drink, the, the, the wrath that was going to come upon him, the, the scourging, the hurt, the crown of thorns, all of that that was going to come upon him, uh, that he was praying that his cup would be taken from him. He certainly was tempted to not take the cup. Instead, and to instead walk away and avoid all of that. But he didn't. He said, not my will be done, but yours, Father. When the guards and the representatives of the priests came armed in the middle of the night with clubs to arrest him, to drag him away, and Peter took out that sword and chopped off the ear, swinging that sword wildly, chopped off the ear of, of the high priest's servant, you and I certainly would be tempted if we're going to be arrested unjustly in the middle of the night by a mob of people, we would be tempted to fight back and we want allies in that fight. We'd be egging Peter on, go, Peter, go. Instead, Jesus says, stop the violence and he heals the high priest servant's ear. His enemy, he heals him. When Jesus stood before his accusers and they were hurling all kinds of false accusations against him, he, he, he remained silent. You and I would be tempted to say something in our defense. The temptation to defend ourselves is very great on much lesser things. When Jesus stood before Pilate and, and Pilate demands to know if he is king of the Jews, it is the one time that Jesus basically opens his mouth and he says, you, you have said so, which is a first century way of saying it's true. But he, he didn't go and qualify it, really. He, just said, he did say his kingdom is not of this world. He doesn't care about the power structures of the Caesars of this world. His kingdom is not of this world. I would be tempted as when Pilate was going through all these other accusations against Jesus to open my mouth and say they're not true. And I can bring witnesses in to tell you that it is not true. But Jesus didn't. He remained silent. Pilate is amazed. Who is this? Every other prisoner he's had paraded before him uh, is, uh, in, with potential of a death penalty is going to offer a defense and a vigorous defense at that. The temptation had to be real to defend himself. When Jesus was brutally nailed and hung on a cross and when he was being mocked, it says this, so also the chief priests and the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we might see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. The temptation had to be very strong for Jesus to say, I'm going to show you my power. I'm going to come down from this cross right now, and I'm going to prove you wrong. All of you. He could have silenced the skeptics in a moment. Why? Why didn't Jesus give in to the many temptations in the last 24 hours of his life? So for those of us who have had the privilege of holding our newborn baby in our arms, for those of us who have witnessed the miracle of a birth of a child and held that child in our arms, we realize very quickly that we would give anything to protect that child, frail, vulnerable, helpless, 
as that child, that newborn is, in need of the sacrificial love of a parent. Jesus knew that his coming down from the cross, his display of power in that way, his giving into temptation would mean that we who have been helpless and harassed in Satan's tempting grasp would be eternally lost. His willing submission to the cross would mean for the first time, that for the first time in human history, a man, Jesus, would never give in to temptation. Not even once. He was and is the only person in all of human history to follow the will of God the Father his entire life. Also, being true God as well, Jesus would be powerful enough that his sacrifice on the cross would be payment for the sin of the whole world, for our giving into temptation time and time again. He's powerful enough to take that upon his shoulders at the moment of his crucifixion. So you see this, this, this empty tomb that those first century ladies witnessed is more than just a simple note in, of historical oddity of a, of a dead man coming to life again, of a dead man overcoming death. It is God's triumph over the deceiving, lying tempter who was unable to defeat Jesus. And now he himself is defeated, the tempter. The empty tomb is God's triumph for you. Every time you and I say yes to grace and forgiveness through Jesus, the tempter is defeated. Every time you and I, by the risen power of, of Jesus Christ, resist the latest tempt, uh, temptation, the tempter suffers another defeat. The tempter is defeated. And that means life for you and for me, eternal life, but it also means a more fulfilling life for us now. Notice I didn't say an easy life. I didn't say a, a carefree life. I didn't say a life without trouble. The Bible doesn't promise you smooth sailing as you follow the resurrected Jesus, but it is a fulfilling life in a way that no giving into the appeal of temptation in your life will ever satisfy you. As you follow Jesus, you will discover what fullness of life really means. And as you do so, the appeals of the temptations that are offered to you will begin to fade. You begin to go into the, the background shown to be the defeated lies that they truly are. Satan has already lost, folks. Where grace abounds in your life, temptation is wounded. Where forgiveness is received in your life, temptation is pierced. Where the joy of Jesus fills your mind, the temptation of the self-centered pursuit of happiness is crushed. The tempter is defeated. The tempter is defeated. Jesus is risen. The tempter has no power over you. The tempter is de defeated. Jesus is victorious. Jesus is risen. By his wounds you are healed. By his, 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 by his piercing you're, you're forgiven and you're joined with God in, 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 in eternal, given in the gift of eternal life. That is God's gift to you. That's what the empty tomb says to you, to all of us. He was pierced for your transgressions. He was crushed for your wrongdoing and the punishment that has brought us peace and victory was upon him. The tempter is defeated. The tempter is defeated. Jesus is risen. O oh, death, where is your sting? Do not tempt us, Satan, with your deceiving lies. We are joined with Jesus, 
who is life. The tempter is defeated, and ours is the life. Ours is the hope. Ours is the victory in and through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is risen, and that changes everything. Alleluia. Jesus is risen. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus is risen. The tempter is defeated. Yours is the kingdom. Yours, yours is, the, is the glory. Join with Jesus because you're a part of his kingdom. You're a part of the kingdom of God. And the glory of God is shining through you in the resurrected power of Jesus Christ, the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. The tempter is defeated. Jesus has risen. You are his. God bless you all. He is alive. And that changes everything. Amen. Let us uh, speak together our faith through the words of the Nicene Creed, this ancient creed that was uh, put together that's a summation of the Christian faith. So please stand as we speak our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures. And he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We have a, a time of confession before the Lord, and the Lord knows what's really on our heart, but what he's inviting us to do is come before him, be honest before him, Come into his presence. Uh, don't hide anything from him. Run to him. It's a mistake for us to run from God. We should run towards him and confess to him. So let us, let's open our hearts and our minds to him. There'll be a time of silence as well that we can really pour out our hearts to God. So from the words uh, from, the, from 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, if we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment in silence to reflect upon our need for Christ. So Lord, let us confess our sins to God our Father, most merciful God. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. But for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the gift of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you so much for joining us on this Resurrection Sunday. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Go forth in the power and the strength of Jesus as uh, his children, knowing that you're held in the everlasting and loving arms of Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Hallelujah. Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Thank <laughs> you.